Hello, and thanks for taking the time to speak about silence and its connection with religion and with your body of work. So glad to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure working, uh, talking with you again and working on uh, a conversation about silence. It's very, you know, important to me. So, and I've enjoyed our other conversations about it. So, uh, glad to be here. The questions dramatized in silence are at the heart of current scholarly attention to religion. I mean questions about enculturation of Christianity in different societies, questions of power and coercion in missionary work, questions surrounding the status of images and objects in religion, and the question really of whether religious belief is justification for human action. Were those questions in your mind as you made the movie, and does one of them stand out to you now with the film finished? Well, I think certainly those questions are there. I mean, as you know, I... I um I had read the book back in 1988, and um, for all those years, try to come to grips, I should say, with uh, uh, translating it to a visual form, um, a film, you know. Uh, it took many years, uh, till about 2006, to be able to work uh, on the script properly with my friend Jay Cox. But um, throughout that time, all these questions did come to mind. That's the point, I think, about... Um, ultimately, what is the essential element of uh, a religion? Um, how does one, uh, without doing damage to the culture that you're bringing these ideas to, how does one help, in a way, other cultures, other people, um, other ways of life, other ways of thinking? Um, so that what I mean is that I think ultimately it has to be the very behavior of those calling themselves Christians. It has to be the behavior, I think. It has to be the essential Christianity in the person who is expounding this, I think. And uh, it's got to be in behavior. And I, I think ultimately people say, oh, well, I'd like to, when somebody grows up and says, I'd like to be like that person was to others, which is um, compassionate, uh, service, and humility. Now, how do you do that? without being an organized group that goes <laughs> into a place uh, people are a completely different culture and a way of life and thinking for so many, for, for generations, for thousands of years. How do you do that? By bringing them something special, you think? Um, and how do you make it special without insulting them, without being arrogant? Uh, these are the questions that were coming up throughout the whole picture because uh, ultimately, especially in Asia, I would think, uh, it's... Uh, tied in inextricably. It's still, to this day, with colonialism, which left a very great scar and a wound on uh, Christianity and, and on, on the East uh, with the uh, missionaries. It's still there, that wound and that scar. Um, and so uh, it's, it's, it's completely tied in with colonization in the East, no doubt, and maybe other places too. So how does one get to the essence of the good, the good, the, the truth of that, you know? One of the most remarkable things about the film is that these questions aren't just questions for the audience or for the filmmaker or for the scholar. They're questions that are actually raised in the movie by the characters. I'm thinking in particular of the former Jesuit. For, yeah, exactly. And there he is uh, on screen suggesting that uh, Catholicism cannot take root in Japan. Japan's a swamp. That Japanese converts to Catholicism aren't real Christians that they worship the sun in the sky rather than the son of God. Uh, can you suggest whether, is he speaking sincerely or is he speaking as a tool of the shogunate? Have they gotten to him? Uh, are we meant to take him at his word? Well, I mean, the, the question there ultimately is, is um, uh, does Christianity remain the same if it takes on the cultural trappings or uh, uh, thinking there, uh, in a way, of another, of another world? Um, and so... Um, uh, you call it acculturation, I guess you're saying? Is that it? Inculturation. Inculturation. Um, yeah, you have to take into mind who the people are, what they believe, what they think, how they think, you know, and then find the essence and find the, the what is similar, what is, <laughs> what is human um, uh, in each other, in a way. So um, if, and this is a layman speaking, but if you take... Uh, uh, if you change the ritual, if you change, I'm not just saying the dogma, but or the beliefs, but if you change the ritual, if you change the approach, 
can the essence of Christianity still survive because it's an ultimate truth? Say, if you, if you work it within the culture of the people you're trying to, quote, convert, unquote, you know? I mean, you have to take into consideration who they are, say. Um, one keeps in mind, yes, Japan, Korea, China, and you keep in mind uh, uh, the Aztecs, the Incas. But what about that? Um, it, 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 there's a historical issue there in terms of, or a moral issue too, uh, is, one, <laughs> is one, one belief and way of behaving, European, Catholic, uh, Christian, um, exonerate the behavior of the Catholics and Christians of what happened with the Incas and the Aztecs because the human sacrifice and the brutality of some of the rituals of uh, their beliefs, um, saying we took them and elevated them out of that, out of that um, hellish way of living, which was really more economic, I think, economics and political. Um, uh, and so uh, what I'm getting at is I think uh, it really, one has to deal with the culture you're, 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 you're um, involved with. You can't ignore that. Um, and so for me, I think the figure of Ferrara is a, certainly a questionable one. There are people who believe that he is just acting out the dictates of the shogunate, that sort of thing, and really doesn't believe in what he's saying. I kind of think he does believe in what he's saying, and I think maybe he really lost his faith. I think he did. I mean, that's the way I think Liam played it. You know, he's certainly convincing as a figure who's yeah, lost. Yeah, well, his you got you have to confront it. You have to provoke, and confront it, and say, "What do you believe?" You know, uh, how could you, how could you be? I, I'm just saying, how could you be a, uh, a Christian thinking, humility, compassion, um, and not feel that you should give if you have something, give something to the people who don't have something in politics in. Uh, how your country behaves, how your politicians behave. How about uh, Father Rodriguez? So the arc of the film moves him from extreme piety to doubt, to the loss of faith, to the open renunciation of faith as he uh, humiliates the few me. Mm -hmm. uh, my students, they read the novel as a simple anti-religious parable about a proud Christian brought low. And yet, I think through the ending of the film, you make clear that in some fashion, Rodriguez is and remains a man of faith. How important is that ending to our understanding of your interpretation of Well, silence? I think that's what we were grappling with for so many years in writing the script. Because I do think, yes, he is arrogant. And yes, I think it's an arrogance of uh, uh, which, as a true believer, a true Christian, acting out Christianity, one has to get past. And uh, particularly if you have the cloth and you go out there and you say, I'm bringing you the truth. Really? Okay, now, um, that makes you very special. Now, how do you get past your own sense of being special? Okay, so he's very arrogant. Uh, he begins to um, go on his own uh, Calvary, so to speak, his own journey, his own stations of the cross. Yet, to even say that is presumption in a way. Presuming to identify that he's his identifying with Jesus. So who yeah. are you? Uh, I mean, yes, I understand, but still, um, he has to know his place and the damage he may be doing to the other people, you know, so that ultimately when Jesus tells him to step on the fumia, Jesus tells him to do that. He hears that voice, it's real, you know, and um, in so doing, uh, it's not as simple as a man revoking, uh, re relinquishing his faith, etc., because he's afraid. It's not as simple because... Um, I think in so doing, and this is the extraordinary part of the Endo novel, I think he um, um, loses, he, he empties himself. He loses himself, finally, into a purer form of Christianity and uh, being Christ-like, which is uh, pure compassion, service, and um, being humble. And by the way, uh, in the epilogue of the book, um, uh, we deciphered that there were many indications that he continued to practice. And that's why we have the crucifix at the end. Uh, he did continue to practice. He continually was asked to renounce. And I think that's one of the reasons they respected him, too, to a certain extent, the authorities, because they knew he was a man of faith. 
real faith. Uh, it's the hard one. It's the hard one. What does Christ want from us? That is the idea of how, you know, the imitation of Christ. Well, how do you do that? You could try that. Have we ever attained it? Will we ever attain it? I don't, I don't know. I mean, you could try. <laughs> and how do you do that? Well, the people around you and how you live and the example you give. So both of these characters, their quandaries have to do with the question of the forms that Christianity takes. Yes. Rodriguez, uh, finally, his, his faith takes a form that is recognized conventionally as apostasy. In that connection, you mentioned a letter that Terrence Malick recently sent to you about the forms oh, yeah, well, Terry, of Christianity. Um, yeah, I hope he doesn't mind. I, I, I'll quote him on this letter because I, I found it very moving. And I mean, I haven't seen Terry and I uh, kind of know each other from the 70s in Los Angeles. And then last time I saw him was when Thin Red Line opened in New York. And over the years, we've corresponded every now and then. I'm a great admirer of his work and who he is. And, um, but uh, he saw silence, and to get the letter right, um, he said, one comes away wondering what our task in life is. Uh, what is it that Christ asks of us, and what new shapes he will assume in these dark times, like those of old? He might appear, as you show, even in those who oppose the faith or betray it, like Judas or Pilate. His love seems to wider. His love seems to be wider for it. Um, so, uh, this is very interesting. You know, what does Christ expect? <laughs> How do we live up to it? And ultimately, is is this the? I guess I think it is um, the way to live, and I think it's uh, well, if one could do it, or at least try. And I do think it's something um, that's probably the only hope for the species. <laughs> that we could somehow get religion more right than it's been gotten? I would or? think so because it, it's not. It's man-made. I mean, what do you do? You have to... Uh, the trappings are man-made. They just are. I mean, I call it trappings. You know, it's the, the church Crosses, is an organization. The, the icon, it's an organization. But they, they, they're they important, though, if taken the right way. If taken... Uh, and I think that might be to allow one to experience something, the spiritual, or you, you, to allow one to experience and enrich that spiritual side of the spiritual aspects of being a human being. I think uh, if they help you get to that, I was, uh, you know, I prefer the crucifix with a body on it rather than one without. Um, I see the body. I, I, uh, I, um, um, it's accessible. I see the suffering. I think of the suffering. Um, it's just something that uh, that doesn't mean that the cross itself, without a figure on it, has no power for me. It does, it really does. But um, I just, of course, grew up that way, so naturally I'm disposed to it, but uh, predisposed to it. But um, uh, no, I think uh, why couldn't certain aspects of the organized religions? Ultimately, they have to change. In order, they have to recreate themselves in order to continue to li to be uh, to be alive. It has to be recreated. It doesn't mean that you have to go. Uh, what's the word? You have to change what you believe. Whether it's uh, uh, goes from uh, murder to uh, death penalty to abortion. It doesn't mean you have to change those think that thinking, but uh, or those beliefs, I should say. Um, but I think uh, there has to be an adjustment to the way the world changes and the way society changes, um, how you work within the changes. Yeah. So in that sense, silence, although set in the early 17th century in Japan, is very much a contemporary movie that speaks to contemporary concerns here. How is Christianity gonna, going to adapt uh, to a different society? In that sense, mm -hmm. I guess it reminds me of some of the films that you've spoken of is meaning a lot to you, religious films. Br yes, yeah. Brisson's Diary of oh, yeah. the Country Priest yeah. or The Flowers of St. Francis of Rossellini or uh, Pasolini's Gospel According to St. Matthew. Yeah, yeah, These films, yeah. they were all about the Christian past and yet they spoke very powerfully to issues of post-war Europe. Did you expressly set out to, to, sp to speak to the present through the past in this film? I, I think I did, and that's why I stayed... Um, how should I say, uh, uh, I was determined to make the picture for so many years because it just became stronger for me, um, especially in the world now, which is uh, there's a, 
the term that's used, the secularization of Western, the Western world. Um, that doesn't mean we have to throw everything out, <laughs> you know, um, and the distrust, uh, and for many good reasons, I would think, of uh, certain organized religions and the way they behave. So there has to be something else then. We have to, uh, we have to get beyond that somehow and be presented with the very um, pure aspects of it. Uh, but I do think, uh, for example, in you know, Diary of a Country Priest was a film that affected me very, very strongly. I, I don't make pictures like that, but the thing is uh, there was that wonderful moment where the priest says to the, one of the main characters, uh, the woman in the film, and I haven't seen it in quite a while. And it's from the Brennanos novel, so uh, this scene takes place in the novel too, in which he tells her, God is not a torturer, he just wants us to be merciful with ourselves. Which, when I first saw that, uh, affected me very deeply. I think it was about 22 years old, 21, really very strongly, and uh, had a, a kind of, uh, how should I put it, um, a healing effect. That doesn't mean... This on mercy rather than mercy, on, on yeah. sternness, let's say. Yes, exactly. It doesn't mean you, <laughs> you can go ahead and do anything that you consider bad. You know it's bad, you know, if it's wrong. Yeah, I mean, put it this way, wrong supposed to write in your own so if you go and you're still doing wrong things you are wrong you know that you could try to correct that do you give in to it completely and that's the that's the uh, uh, the pendulum that swings back and forth and um, but that even the person who does something wrong is deserving of mercy is what well that that's what I Bresson. that's what I think in the so. breast even the persons yeah persons who will live a, a life that uh, committed many wrong wrong acts, so to speak, uh, is, uh, the Christian ideal is, is uh, deserving of mercy, right? Um, and that's a, a pretty provocative thing, especially today in, in the world, like with all this information, what people have done in their past and what they're doing, or all this sort of thing. Do they deserve mercy too? And if they've harmed so many people, you know, well, in Christian idea, they do. How do you do that? I, I find it hard, you know. We all do. <laughs> we all do. But this is where Christ is pushing us, see. Maddening, but it's, it's, a, it's a challenge, and it's, it, it's the right way, I think. I, in the case of um, Flowers of St. Francis, that just the beauty of um, the idea, that <laughs> Francis of Assisi taking everything and saying, no, I discard everything, and I live free and open. Um, and uh, uh, totally, again, um, provoking the Vatican to think differently about who they are. I don't know if it didn't succeed, certainly. I think uh, the Franciscans apparently, right after Francis died, sort of went into a period of, um, it was just the opposite. They, they got, uh, got organized they got and organized. became a standard yeah. organization. Like a union. So it's like an <laughs> unions grew up sometimes, you know. So it happens. This is, uh, uh, how should I put it, man-made, as I say. But what it, Francis did was kind of interesting, really put it, um, again, in a very basic form. Uh, and also the idea of uh, people that uh, people laugh at or abuse, which is the holy fool which is an interesting concept. Person's a fool, really. <laughs> but also holy. <laughs> yeah, interesting, you know. Um, uh, for, for what? For, as opposed to those who believe in knowledge, which I do, I really, <laughs> fascinating, but it's, <laughs> how should I put it? Uh, but in, with knowledge is always a kind of um, hazy effect. In other words, there's only so much and then there's you only know so much, and there's more to know. You'll never know everything. And Walker so, Percy talked about a guy who got all A's and flunked life. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> you, you can know so much. But you know so much, but you, you still got to. And the life is 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 what Francis does. I, I, I hard. He knows how to live. He knows somehow. how to live. Yeah, somehow. But he had gone through the Crusades. He came back through the fever. You know that long. You know, so he had gone through a great deal and saw something else, and then made at least for a while, made the Vatican and the organized church the power, the, the secular power of the church, uh, or you know, political power, made them rethink who they are and what they really believe in. Um, 
by that moment. I believe, what pope was it? I forget. Innocent the third. That sounds right. Yeah, I think when one way he said it's okay when when Francis went there to to, to uh, yeah, plead his case. That he would meet the pope at all was pretty striking. It was amazing. Yeah, um, and uh, so so that that film uh, has such innocence to it, um, and uh, is a provocation because of that. It really is because you say, well, how come, who are these people? Why are they behaving this way? And they have such joy. And so <laughs> they're very pleased with, and they're helping every. It's madness. And it's, it's wonderful madness, you know? And uh, it's beautifully made. And also, made, uh, the actors are actual monks. So it's a real thing. And then the other one what was the, oh, but Pasolini's Gospel According to St. Matthew, or Gospel According to Matthew, as he pointed, took the saint off. Um, he, uh, yeah, that was one that uh, has a. There's, I, have to, I think it's probably the best film of uh, um, on the uh, Gospels, so to speak. The script is Matthew. <laughs> um, the use of music is brilliant. The non-actors are brilliant. The whole idea of well, the whole the whole approach, the kind of uh, visual poetry, a kind of rough-edged visualization, uh, almost semi-documentary. Not really, but more at that time they say cinema verite in a way. You almost felt like you really feel, um, um, how should I put it, more than just being in a place and a time. You really feel the, the, the world um, of uh, Jesus at that time. You feel it, and you feel his power somehow and beauty and um, a little afraid, uh, the anger, you know, the contradictions I've come to uh, separate father from daughter and daughter-in-law and other, this whole incredible moment where he, he does that malediction, so to speak. He, he, it's beautifully shot. And really feel the, the use of Bach, the use of lead belly, um, all of this extraordinary uh, music. So, you know, he really did it. Um, I had wanted to do one in 60 millimeter black and white back in the early 60s of the Gospels, but shot on the Lower East Side and everybody and living in tenements. And, but then I saw that. Cancelled Pasolini out. had done it. So. Yeah, he did. He did it in the actual period, but I was going to do it in modern day, modern dress, just kind of abstracted in a way. Uh, but there's something really, yeah. But to, again, I guess a desire to to um, engage the gospel uh, in the modern day, in our lives every day. There was another film, or Debt was the other one that Carl Dreyer did, that is so powerful I can't watch it again because it has at the end, and I won't give it away. But, but it's. Uh, Faith um, transcends uh, death. And he actually makes that real on screen. Yeah. From the, based on a famous play, et cetera. And so it was so moving and uh, so powerful that it's uh, so necessary to look at again. So that helps us to situate silence in connection with great films by your precursors. It also fits into your own body of work. A lot has been, a fair amount has been said about the... Uh, connection of silence to the last temptation of Christ, maybe less so about the connection of silence to Kundun. And can you speak on the connection between those two movies? And are these three movies your religious trilogy? I don't know if I intended as a trilogy. It just seemed to be, uh, these were projects that I, uh, The Last Temptation was something that I had planned from, or in a sense planned for a story, a gospel story, so to speak, uh, going way back to the, when I, before seeing Gospel According to Matthew. Um, so when I was about 18 years old, 17 years old, I was planning if I could ever make a movie or do something. And that, that was constantly obsessed with it. So it was, it was appearing in different forms and projects I was writing about for school and things like that. So next, the next step was a film. And so Last Temptation came out of that because between the Pasolini and then be, between that and more conventional may be a bad word, but uh, uh, traditional uh, epic films coming out of Hollywood, even ones that took chances like King of Kings, Nick Ray, uh, or Barabbas, which is an interesting, beautiful story, and an underrated film by Richard Fleischer did a version of it, and Anthony Quinn. Um, the, one had to go against all this and had to find a new way. And I found that uh, The Last Temptation was something that uh, uh, raised questions that I thought we should be able to, be, to speak about as Catholics, as Christians, as people. Um, the reception to the picture, of course, was uh, um, 
farcical and crazy. And so it became something that was very draining. Uh, and then take me, it took me on a road, I don't know. It took me to a certain place. And then I found we had to go further. As a filmmaker or in, oh, a, as a person. in terms of religion? Religion, yeah. I had to go further than that. I had to go further even than the iconography of uh, Christianity. And so um, the fascination was always with uh, um, compassion and humility. And again, um, getting past arrogance, uh, losing a sense. And I wondered, I always wondered about um, the inner world, um, what that has to do with Eastern religion and how that's achieved and how that certain harmony is achieved. Um, and uh, it's fascinating to me, and maybe there's some aspects of certainly of uh, exoticism to it, but I wanted to find out more. And Melissa Matheson had written this very beautiful script, and we thought it was time to try it, to see if we can work this out and reach a kind of, uh, mm, I hate to use the word, but it is reaching out for transcend, transcendent uh, experience in making the picture and then seeing it. So we were very lucky to be able to get to make it. And while you were making Kundun, did you, you also had in mind that you were eventually going to make a picture about Christianity in Asia? Yes, so you, definitely. So you, you were seeing the two films? Yeah, but I couldn't approach that because Christianity is, I'm Christian, so Catholic, so I could explore um, what I, meditation or transcendence or the metaphysics of the East, I could explore it, I don't know, but I could find my way through it maybe with the help of uh, the Tibetans, with the help of the Dalai Lama, with the help of Melissa Matheson, who uh, sadly is now gone, and um, and be in that world, you know? Be in that world, be around it, I could explore it. But to translate it to Christian and Catholic um, expression through Endo, because I knew that was the right way to go, very hard. So what was that, 1997? We made silence when? Uh, 20 years later. 20 years later. <laughs> and I kept thinking, we're going to make it, we're going to make it, and I still didn't know. I mean, maybe I don't know, but what I'm saying is that I got to a point where I felt I did, you know, and finally it was finished somehow. Well, it makes sense in that contra Hollywood, religious people take the long view, and to take 20 years to sort these things yes. out, it's... Yeah, that's, that's how much time it takes. Yeah, and no, no, and, and also, they, I mean, I had it kind of ready about in 2007, 2008, but then personal things intervened and uh, there's certain response uh, situations and when I had to be taken care of. So, um, and, uh, you know, it's not, these are not the kind of pictures that people want to make in Hollywood. So um, I had to find a way uh, to m make myself somewhat solvent in terms of filmmaking um, to be able to um, um, get the financing, so to speak, for a picture that you're, you know, that uh, maybe made on set may have a limited audience. I don't know, but um, I have a feeling though that um, if it's pursued, if it is shown again, if it's spoken about, if people screen it, if you see it on television, there might be ultimately a, um, uh, those who do uh, will give themselves to it might find it rewarding. I don't know, and I, I um, best I could do is to make it, and the studio did the best they could, Paramount, releasing it. Uh, 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 Brad Gray, who sadly died, uh, he, he really pushed the picture. Um, he was the head of the studio. Uh, he died uh, only a couple of months ago. Um, I mean, this was, uh, to have that kind of a studio a machine, so to speak, behind a picture like that, amazing um, and maybe uh, you know it, it, it's many different reasons why it, I think to touch upon aspects of religion in a deeper way doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a, a picture that everybody's going to flock to it may not be as accessible at first I don't know well the film existed in your imagination and now it really exists and that you were able to get it made is uh, itself extraordinary that you were able to get it made in the way that you made it is extraordinary and we're all in your debt for that. Thank you so much for taking well, thank the you. time thank you. to talk about it. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Well, um, I want to thank the AAR Award, um, the Jury Award for 
uh, in religion and the arts. And um, uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Robert Puckett and the annual meetings manager and Sarah Levine, AAR liaison to the award jury um, for putting together this event uh, as well as screening at least uh, uh, the two, three films, uh, Kundun and Silence. Um, I must say, though, that I am very sorry that I can't be there. I really am. I had planned to be in Boston. What is it, the 19th? You know, today's 17th. So I really planned, but we're shooting this movie uh, in the environs of New York. No matter where it is, it's hard to get to. <laughs> Traffic is impossible. We're now going into our 10th week. We have another 10 weeks. Um, the holidays are coming, uh, and we are shooting all night tonight. Uh, now it's about what, uh, two o'clock or so, or two thirty. So we're going to be going till six in the morning. Um, and physically, it's, uh, it's almost it was an impossibility to get away. But I'm so sorry I can't be there in person. But I really do appreciate this and the opportunity to uh, talk to you again, Paul, about this. And hopefully, I didn't ramble too much. Thank you. Thank you so much.